we've started. The blue line is what happened with the shale sector. About 2012, that is when the majority of the natural gas consumed on this continent came from shale. A lot of that's waste gas. And so we tripled our investment in a couple of years and it hasn't fallen back. The refining sector, the chemicals effects are all expanding very quickly. It's actually the biggest build we've seen ever in the history of the country, faster than World War II. The gray bar is kind of the everything else category and it's sliding up. You'll notice that in the last couple of years, it's picked up quite a bit. This is where we're all noticing it though. This is electronics and computing. Now, a lot of people are like, isn't this all the IRA and the CHIPS Act? And that's some of it. This spot right here, that's where the CHIPS Act and the IRA were passed. So all of this happened before. The industrial base is expanding significantly, but we need that kind of jack up for absolutely everything. There will be winners and losers. There's no way around that. On the high end, if you want a semiconductor fab facility, you need a lot of people in their 20s and 30s who are really clever. And the greatest concentration of those people in the country is the Colorado Front Range and the Arizona Sun Corridor. I know everybody thinks about Arizona and they think old people. They do have a lot of old people in Arizona. However, they're all white. Arizona actually has a very healthy demography. It doesn't have a labor shortage. It has a bilingual training problem. Different problem. And so you're seeing these areas pick up most of the investment for that because they've got a lot of green space. It's not taking over farms, so the land is cheap. And most of the people who move in are in their 20s and their 30s, and they tend to be very highly educated. That's where the concentration of labor for that sector happens to be, and policy is matching. You want to do automotive, you're looking at either the Great Lake regions or the South. Now, the Great Lake regions is all unionized. And so everything that has to do with internal combustion engines is going there. And we've seen that expand massively. Pros and cons. Pros, there's a lot of industrial plant there. You can rehabilitate a lot of the brown space. It's actually a relatively light carry from an investment point of view. The downside is they're not moving into any of the new stuff. And they probably can't, not just because it's unions, but because there's a population lid. This area has seen out migration pretty robust over the last 30 years. There aren't enough young people to stock a lot of new industrial plant. For that, you go to the south. And so most of the foreign investment is in the South. Most of the new battery facilities in the South. Almost of the EV construction is in the South. But the place that is just going to kick ass and take names is the Texas Triangle, especially Houston, because you've got almost 20 million people, about a third of whom have immigrated within the last 10 years, tends to be younger than the national average. They have a footprint in Mexico. They can access that part of the supply chain. And Houston has a foot in the energy corridors as well. So all of the inputs that you need for all of the stuff we need to do is already there. Let's talk about the Mexicans. This is a uh, population density map. The deep red, those are the urban cores. The yellow are small towns and suburbs. And if you look north of the border, that pattern, dense urban cores, suburbs, small towns, as a geographer, that tells me that it rains. Rain makes farms, farms make small towns, small towns make suburbs, suburbs make inner cities. South of the border, you don't have that because it's desert. Pros and cons. Pros, it's oligarchic. There's no interaction among the urban centers in Mexico. Physical interconnections are very, very thin. So only a few families run everything and have since independence over a century and a half ago. Which means if you're an American and you're looking for a partner, all you have to do is go south, figure out who's in charge, knock on their door, introduce yourself. Two weeks later, you'll be leaving with a blistering hangover, a godchild, because you're part of the family now, and a fistful of signed contracts that you know you can rely upon because you now have a personal connection. Biggest downside of that, though, is once you've gobbled up the labor in that urban area, you're done. Mexicans are not mobile in the way that Americans are. They don't move within their country very much to take jobs because the infrastructure doesn't support it. And the cities stop, and then you just have desert. There's no intermingling at the edges. And the Texans have been working on this for 40 years, and they have already gobbled up probably 80% of the labor that was available. Which means, if we're going to rely on the Mexicans to do what we need to do, and oh my god, we need to rely on the Mexicans to do what we need to do, 
the northern section of the country is not the solution. It's got to be the center. The problem is that the infrastructure isn't there to support it. There are only three, yeah, I'll point, the three black lines, those are the only three intermodal freight facilities within the entire country. They don't interconnect. They just go south on a specific corridor and they don't really branch off. And if the northern Mexicans have already been metabolized, we have to make it all the way down to Mexico City. That's a thousand miles away. Which means we need to invest at least a trillion dollars in Mexican infrastructure in order to reach at scale the 50, 60 million people who live in the center of the country. And we have to do so in a way that doesn't make the Mexicans think that we're trying to take over, which is kind of what we're trying to do. This is going to be touchy. But if we don't pull it off, we will not have the labor to do what we need to do. Because if we still want stuff in a post-China world, we need help to build it. We need a differentiated labor market. And the Mexicans are the only ones within arm's reach that can help with that. There are other players that are further abroad, but we can't integrate with them the same way we can integrate with a neighbor. The Southeast Asian countries look pretty good to me. Thailand is the fastest aging one, but it still has at least another 25 years. The Indonesians and the Vietnamese are great. In fact, the, the Vietnamese are kind of scary. They've expanded their higher educational system with technical skills in mind. 40% of college grads in Vietnam are STEM graduates. They are attempting, and it looks like they're gonna pull it off, to leapfrog over China from a technological point of view, and they will probably achieve that within the next three or four years. There's also a geography situation that is very helpful. On the left, you're looking at a, a vegetation map, basically, and the green is tropics. And when you think about building infrastructure in tropics, in mountains, on peninsulas, on islands, it's an expensive, ugly business because you really can't get economies of scale. But there's pros and cons to that, too. The con is that these countries have never gone to war with one another like they have in, say, Europe or Northeast Asia. There's not a lot of bad blood. And that means that almost everyone started out in tropical agriculture. And if there's one thing that everyone in tropical agriculture can agree on is it's that no one wants to be in tropical agriculture. In temperate zone agriculture, there's a, there's a value chain. You, can, you don't have to do it all by hand. You can get a tractor, you can get a combine, you can get a spreader. In the tropics, no, 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 tropical fruits harvested by hand, tended to by hand, transported by hand. You can't have a combine harvesting mangoes. It's all unskilled labor. And so whenever people in tropical ag have a chance, they move out and they go to the cities. And that means population density. Their cities are wildly overpopulated for the skill set of the labor. And that means this is the most competitive part of the world for value added manufacturing. This is where we're gonna see a big footprint expand. Already has, and you're talking about a billion people. There are already more people in coastal Southeast Asia than there are in coastal China. They're probably the biggest winners in the world after Mexico. But it will look different. Population density again. You'll notice that there aren't threads. When you look at a more normal population structure in an industrialized or industrializing country, you get your urban hub, and you've got threads of highways that are densely settled going out to the next population center. And that allows for what we consider to be multi-step supply chains, because there's multiple population centers linked together tightly. You can move things back and forth through the system. That doesn't happen in Mexico. It's desert, it's mountainous, it's jungle. Combination thereof. And so each urban core will be good, very good at one or two things. And that's it, because they don't have access to a complementary system. So what we do in the United States is we might make the frame, we send it across, they put in the spark plugs, they send it back, we put in the computer system, we send it back, they put in the seats and it's going to different cities each time. And it's that back and forth that makes it work. But they can't do that at scale within their own system. They have to have that partner. The Vietnamese do not. It's a much more traditional system from our point of view. And so the Vietnamese can do top to bottom manufacturing. The only thing they have to worry about are the components that they can't make themselves, which are substantial. But you can have Vietnam as 
almost a one-stop shop for most of what we need. We just can kind of add the dusting of the tech that's necessary to make it work. It's cheaper to do. Unfortunately, it's 7,000 miles further away, so we can't do the back and forth. Two different models. All right, let's talk products. Uh, if you're at the uh, top of this, you don't know who your third tier suppliers are, much less your 13th. If you're at the bottom, you can probably fit your entire supply chain on the back of a cocktail napkin after throwing back a few bourbons. If you're on the left, or excuse me, on the right, uh, you're already within the NAFTA system. If you're on the right, you're dependent on the Chinese. Couple examples, energy. American energy is made with American capital. It's on American pipelines, American workers going to American refineries, ending up with an American consumer. And that is not simple at all. 1,400 supply chain steps for the iPhone, 91% of which involve mainland China in some fashion. The new iPhone just came out a couple weeks ago. You might want to buy two. We're probably getting close to the point where this is the last one. Here's everybody else. Going to pull out a few of these. Uh, automotive. Courtesy of NAFTA 2. Over 90% of the supply chains for autos sold in North America are manufactured in North America. Don't mean to suggest we're not going to have some hiccups, but the core of it has already worked and the rest is just network effects. That's not bad. In terms of foreign investors, the Europeans are of the belief that they can bring in all the parts and just assemble it here. That's not going to work very well. The Asians have figured out that they need to actually do the manufacturing here. So they're probably north of 70% manufactured within North America, where most European companies are less than 10 Heavy vehicles are going to be a problem, though. When you have globalization, it's very common for countries to put their thumbs on the scale to encourage parts of the industrial plant to be in their countries, especially if it's something they can technologically do without a lot of help. As big as they are, a forklift is actually simpler than a passenger car in terms of the equipment and the construction. And since not everybody needs a forklift, it's not like you're going to have these facilities everywhere. So the Chinese really have dominated that space. So forklifts, dump trucks, construction equipment, agricultural equipment, we're going to have a real problem when the Chinese go away. But it is a relatively easy fix because anyone who can do automotive at scale can also do heavy equipment at scale. It's just a question of the numbers being right. And nothing like half of the stuff vanishing from the world is going to make the numbers right. That's where I'm worried the most. A successful electronics and computing sector requires a lot of different labor price points. Because the person who does the plastic molding is not the person who does the die cast, or pulls the wire, or builds the chip, or does the software, or polishes the lenses. That's a different step with a different skill set at a different price point. And one of the many reasons that the East Asians are so good at this is you've got 11 different labor sets within one extended market. And they can all specialize at what they do best. We don't have that in North America. We have two price points, us, Mexico, that's it. And so we have to change how this is all done. The textiles example gives me hope that we can, but I have no idea in hell how because we haven't had to figure it out yet. But we're gonna have to, real soon. And we probably are gonna have to do it without Northern Mexico, because that's already spoken for. All right, here's where things get a little messy. Not all semiconductors are made equal. We all hear about the CHIPS Act and what the Biden administration wants to do. That's for a very, very specific kind of chip. 10 nanometer and smaller, the most advanced one in the world. Now today, 92% of those come from Taiwan, 8% from South Korea. If every facility that is under construction in the United States because of the CHIPS Act ultimately comes to fruition, we will be making less than 5% of the global total. It's a start, it's not huge. The Koreans and the Taiwanese have been working on this for a long time. Here's the problem. The Taiwanese manufacture most of them. They fabricate most of them. But most of the technology that allows them to do so is not Taiwanese. They just have the end production. There's a coalition of over 9,000 companies worldwide 
half of which only produce one product for one customer that ends up in a Taiwanese facility. You pull any of those out of the constellation, the whole thing stops until you repair the constellation. We're going to have to rebuild an entire environment in order to continue putting these chips together. That's going to take a decade. All it takes is one country falling out. I'm personally most concerned about the Germans on this one. Now, on the other extreme, you've got the dumb chips, the 90 nanometer and bigger. This is your Internet of Things, your, your smart blender, the shower brush that sings to you, your smart lights. 80% of those are made by the Chinese, and they can do that without outside help. The other 20% is kind of a split between Japan and the United States. Now, if the Chinese were to vanish tomorrow, obviously the Internet of Things would just die. I would argue that's not that big of a deal. And we have the technology, we have the knowledge, we don't have to reinvent anything. We just need a couple years to build low-end fab facilities. The Mexicans are very interested in getting into that space. The problem that they face is bilingual technical language skills. If, you ever have, if you've got kids who are looking for a way to make a lot of money really quick, tell them to learn how to assemble chips and to do it in Spanish and go down there and be translators because that is going to be the single biggest friction point in the bilateral relationship for the next decade or two. And then everything in the middle, 10 to 90, that's your car. That's your planes. That's most power management systems. That's smart meters. We're probably okay there because those are made in Germany and Italy and here in Japan and Korea, Taiwan, even a little bit in China with imported gear. That looks okay. It's the high end I'm really worried about because those high end chips, that's AI. All these server farms are getting built to do AI at scale. No, we're not going to have the chips for it. That's the iPhone. We're not going to have the chips for them. That's electric vehicles. Electric vehicles have two to three grand worth of chips and they're all either the very high end or the very low end we won't be able to sustain it and everything that comes from it. Now, for you guys' world more uh, specifically, here's your lives. Yeah, there's no way to fix that fast. Order from everyone. Find a way. Counting on half of them not making it. That's the biggest sticking point you guys have by far. This doesn't look that great either. This is space that the Chinese dominate utterly, and replacing that at scale is not a two-year program. It's not just the manufacturer. The assembly requires a lot of fingers and eyes and a lot of quality control, and there is no other country in the world that can step into that space quickly. So we're talking about a significant build-out that's not just capital-intensive, but is very labor-intensive, and it is not clear where, if, that can happen with today's technology. This stuff we kind of do in our sleep. Okay, the stuff in the middle, I'm sorry, no, let me, uh, this is the stuff we do in our sleep. The United States is a weird economy in that we're very, very high end and very, very low end at the same time. We have a lot of elbow room, we have a lot of forest, we have a lot of wood, and courtesy of the shale industry, we have a lot of things that are energy intensive that we're the world's most competitive. None of that's in danger. And this is the stuff that the Mexicans are gonna be helping us with. The slower China breaks down, the more time we have to build the industrial plant that we need to give you guys the guts of what you need. But that means working with the Mexicans as forward looking as possible to build the stuff out so we don't start the day that stuff from China just vanishes. Oops, there we go. My biggest concern about China is the information block in there has now become so intense that we just can't get information at all. And we might not find out that the government has collapsed until the stuff just stops arriving. We're not gonna have a lot of warning. All right, I showed you guys this last year, population density map on this side, uh, economic map on this side. The areas that are populated are also the areas that are economically viable. It's a pure weather thing. Russia has weather. People live where it's less. The Russian strategy is pretty straightforward. Expand out of the weather or the area that's decent until you hit a series of geographic barriers that you can't shove tanks through. And then forward position your military in the access points between them. 
Ukraine is in the unfortunate position of not controlling those access points, but it's on the way to one in Romania and one in Poland. So whenever the Russians are done with Ukraine, if they can win, they will move on to the next line of countries, five of which are in NATO. American Western foreign policy is very simple. Prevent them from having that opportunity. Now, here we have the Ukrainian demographic structure. After independence in 1992, over a third of the population either left or died. Some of the lowest birth rates we've ever seen. Another third of the population since the war has fled as refugees, mostly women and children. So this is pre-war data. We're very close to the point in Ukraine where they will not have the population density that is required to maintain industrial level infrastructure. So whether it is food or steel or coal or just stuff transiting, Ukraine is not going to survive the next 30 years, even if they win the war. There's another problem in that space. This is, um, hang on, my hair's falling apart here. This is the Russian permafrost. It's a geological phenomenon. You go 10 to 30 feet down and you hit a layer where it never melts. But the top chunk melts in the summer and turns into a bog. It is the most difficult environment in the world for mineral extraction. So the Russians have the most, expens most expensive upfront cost to bring stuff online. You basically have to wait for it to freeze solid. You run a berm out to your production site. You run a rail line or a pipe or a road along that berm. And then you have a, a pad that you drill from when it's frozen. because You can't drill through mud. It's a very dynamic landscape because if an aquifer cracks open, everything just kind of slides and follows the aquifer. Or maybe it drains down, in which case you just get a, a sinkhole pit that opens. Or maybe there's no aquifer, you just get a warm summer. And the vegetation that's been frozen for eons starts to thaw, starts to decompose. Decomposing vegetable matter gives off methane and the whole land buckles. Which means that the Russians have the highest maintenance costs for any mineral production in the world. Here's the problem. Russian population structure. Now, about the time that people who were 15 were getting born, 2004, 2005, that's when the Russians stopped collecting data and just started making it up. So you've got that big gouge in the 20-somethings, post-Cold War birth rate collapse, and then you have fabricated data. There probably are only half as many children as this data would suggest. The Russian educational system collapsed back in 1985. So we had a collapse in the birth rate, a collapse of the educational system, which means that the youngest people in Russia who actually have technical skills at scale, they turned 62 this year. The year before the Russians started fabricating data, the life expectancy for the average Russian male was 67. They already have the worst skilled labor pool relative to their population and their needs in the world. And they're very close from simply losing all of it. The maintenance on the Russian systems, the development on the Russian systems, hasn't been done by the Russians for the most part. It's been done by BP or ExxonMobil and especially the Dutch and the Germans and all that went to zero when the war started. So whether it's sanctions, war damage or simple lack of maintenance, we need to prepare for a world where everything that the world has become reliant upon from the Russians, palladium, platinum, oil, gas, even timber, just doesn't come anymore. There's another angle to it that's a little uglier. Now, this guy, uh, you can see where the ethnic Russian territories are in the, the top left. Uh, you've got Turkic minorities off to the east and the south. The problem is this is not an ethnic map. It's a population change map. The green zones are where population growth is happening roughly on pair with Florida and has for four decades. And the red zones are population losses roughly equivalent to Detroit and has been for four decades. Almost all the raw materials are produced in the green zones that are not controlled by ethnic Russians where they're experiencing population growth, but they're shipped through and processed in the red zones where the last bits of the skilled labor pool are that is in terminal decline. 
So you can add demographics to the reasons that we need to kiss the Russian stuff goodbye as well. Not to mention that this is going to be a very politically unstable region in the not too distant future because of the mismatch. One of the many reasons that the Russians feel that the Ukraine war is necessary is if they can get to kind of that outer crustal defense that they used to have in the Soviet period, then they can focus their forces internally to police this demographic flip. They're fighting for time. If they can pull this off, they probably buy themselves another 50 years. If they fail, they're gone within 20. All right, let me take a big dump on green tech. We talked about this a little bit last time I saw you guys. I think I even showed you this graphic. I mean, oversimplifying here, but um, thermal power, internal combustion engines, not all that complicated. You light a match, you start a fire, you capture the heat in some way. Can't do that with an EV system, can't do that with green tech. The process of producing the energy, transmitting the energy, storing the energy, requires an order of magnitude more materials and different materials. We're looking here at an EV versus an ICE vehicle. You can just see at a glance. And then here's the same kind of idea, but for generation, with solar and wind at the top, conventional thermal at the bottom. We need three times as much copper by 2030. We need 20 times as much lithium. We need 10 times as much nickel. There isn't enough on the planet to pull that off. And the Russians are a top three producer of these things. So they just, it, it can't happen. It's not physically possible with today's technology for the world. There is one way it might be possible for us. This is where all the stuff comes from that is not what we would consider to be part of our friends and family network. If we use our military, which is done with the war on terror, which is recruited and rested and rearmed, and we go and conquer all of these places, and we run a Belgian imperial style extraction empire, and bring all of it home, then we can do the green transition, but no one else. Now, this is not a recommendation. I'm just saying that the path we're on, this is the only way that it works. And even that would not be enough because you still have to turn it into processed material. Lithium ore is useless. You have to turn it into lithium metal. The red bars are the stuff that, where that processing happens in either China or Russia. And even that's not enough. You have to talk about finance. Here you're looking at the full cycle cost for a natural gas combined cycle plant. The blue is the construction, the siting, the building. The gray is the fuel, full life cycle. This is a model you're familiar with. This is what you all do. The idea is it's a subscription model. You pay as you go. That doesn't work for green tech. For green tech, it's almost all up front. This is wind. Capital costs have tripled. They will triple again. I think most of the plans that were put out there four years ago assumed that there would never be a 100 basis point increase in capital costs. We've now gone up by 500. We have another 500 to go. The market can't support this. The IRA will help maybe sand down some edges. But we're going to have to do something that in the United States we really don't like doing. We're going to have to choose what we want to focus on. The smart play would be to put it solar panels where it's sunny, not in Massachusetts. Put wind turbines where it's windy, not in Florida and wire the power to where we actually live. But we're not gonna do that. that, that's the smart thing. <laughs> All right, another matrix. If you're at the top, you want the government out of your personal life. If you're at the bottom, you think the government should regulate social norms in some way. If you're on the right, you want the government out of your wallet, and if you're on your left, you think the government should intervene in people's wallets to get the resources it needs to remake society in some way. And you can kind of combine these things. So if you're at uh, the bottom right, an economic and a social conservative, uh, you're kind of opposed to food stamps on principle because famine builds character. And if you're at the, <laughs> if you're at the top left, a social liberal and an economic conservative, you want to bring all of the bureaucrats and Washington together for a big party where you'll serve arsenic cake. Here are our political factions. The single biggest effect that Donald Trump had is he elevated a faction to prominence that really hadn't voted before. 
Most of the people who voted for him the first time he ran for president hadn't voted in the previous four presidential elections. A lot of different estimates for how many people that is, but all of them are north of 10 million voters. They are now not simply the single largest voting bloc in the country. They've taken over the Republican Party because in calling to these people, Trump ended up picking fights with what he would call the rhinos. People who are, were the traditional leaders of the, 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 the traditional leaders of the policy. He ejected them from his White House. He ran, he campaigned against their candidates in Congress, and he completely purged them from the Republican national conventions. They're not even present in the decision-making apparatus of the party now. And in effect, they've become swing voters. But he was able to attract other factions that were closer to his social conservative core supporters. And a lot of people have switched sides. This is the MAGA coalition. This is the Republican Party of today. This has lots of consequences. Let's focus on three. First, the unions are swing voters. That hasn't happened in a century and a half. We're entering a period where we need to double the size of the industrial plant. How many of those jobs do you think are blue collar? We have a labor shortage, and we will for at least another decade, probably two. We're going to see the greatest increase in union activity and union power in the history of the republic in the next 10 to 20 years. The business community are swing voters now. That hasn't happened in the last 150 years. And this is crazy because, you know, the unions versus business, that tug of war, that is modern economics. Their discussions, their debates, their compromises, their negotiations, that is our economic policy for five generations. And these people are right now not even in the room. Part of the reason why economic policy out of both the Obama and the Trump administration just seems so nuts it was because there's no one in either administration that can do math. In fact, on both sides, they're kind of offended by the concept that you need to be able to do math to run an economy. The group that most fancies themselves economists in the Biden administration today are the Greens. Until such time as the unions or the business or both end up in one coalition or the other, economic policy making decisions, choices about where we need to focus are going to be completely divorced from reality. And this is going to last bare minimum for another presidential cycle. Now, we will get through this. The idea that the two economically most capable, competent, and numerous voting blocks on these topics are going to remain outside the political system, that's silly. But it's going to take time for us to figure out where they're going to land. And the political coalitions are going to look very, very different on the other side. So best of luck, because not only will you not be getting good guidance or regulation, there isn't a logic to it. And that's just the environment you're operating in at a time when you're going to have to at least double the grid. No pressure. <laughs>